abortion was made illegal in the United States of America. What did that mean for women? Well, almost 3,000 of us forced to undergo illegal abortions started dying each year. And around the same time, a man named Anthony Comstock, secretary of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, teamed up with the Young Men's Christian Association, yes, the YMCA, and managed to pass a series of laws that branded all contraception as obscene, immoral, and therefore illegal. You know, because if a woman had access to a, a diaphragm or a condom, she might actually be able to have sex on her own terms, just for pleasure. So around 80 years later, in 1960, when the first ever birth control pill was introduced, it wasn't legal in some states for doctors to actually prescribe it. It took a Supreme Court case, Griswold v. Connecticut, in 1965 to make it lawful for married women to use contraception. Only married women. Unmarried women would have to wait seven more years for their own Supreme Court case. Eisen's that versus Baird in 1972 before they were legally allowed to use the pill. But that earlier case, Griswold versus Connecticut, was important, not just because after the birth control pill became legal, college enrollment for women who had been prescribed the pill by the age of 18 rose by 20%. The law was important because it established that a woman was allowed to use birth control based on her constitutional right to privacy. And that same right to privacy was the basis for the big one in 1973, Roe v. Wade. Why was the idea of privacy so essential in these cases? Because women in America have never been protected by an equal rights amendment in the Constitution. Even today, the USA is still one of the only developed countries in the world with no provision in their constitution that specifically addresses gender equality. And because women in America have never been protected by an equal rights amendment, our right to bodily autonomy has never been explicitly guaranteed. So the only legal precedent that protects our constitutional right to make our own choices about our own bodies is the right to privacy upheld in Griswold versus Connecticut and Roe v. Wade. More on that in a bit. But first, back to our history lesson. On January 22nd, 1973, the landmark Supreme Court ruling Roe v. Wade struck down a statute that had criminalized abortion in Texas. So in 1973, for the first time since the late 1800s, American women were once again in control of their reproductive freedom. And life became a lot better. Prior to 1973, abortion was so unsafe that 17% of all deaths due to pregnancy and childbirth were the result of illegal abortion. After Roe v. Wade, abortion mortality rates plummeted to less than 1%, and women's reproductive freedom produced a ripple effect into other areas of our lives. Why, just a year after Roe women finally had the right to get a credit card without their husband's permission. Yes, that is a true story. If you didn't know that, now you know. Before 1974, women could be legally denied a credit card unless their husband gave permission. I mean, it's almost as if reproductive rights are... Native has fantastical scents like coconut and vanilla, sea salt and cedar, eucalyptus and mint. Tied to other rights. All of a sudden, women were able to pursue educational and employment opportunities that were often unthinkable prior to Roe v. Wade. But as soon as Roe was passed, the movement against reproductive freedom took one look at all of those women happily controlling their own bodies, going to college, and dynamically entering the workforce. And they said, oh, hell no. The anti-choice movement went into full gear, and it hasn't let up since. Conservative Catholics, newly radicalized evangelical Christians, and far-right legislators immediately convened on Washington, D.C. in a mission to politicize abortion, strip women of their constitutional right to privacy, and ultimately 
overturn Roe. By the mid-80s, violent extremists were assaulting women outside of clinics, murdering abortion providers, and bombing their workplaces. But perhaps most effectively, the war on women was waged in the courts. In 1992, Planned Parenthood v. Casey upheld a woman's right to abortion established by Roe v. Wade. But it opened the door for making access to abortion a lot more difficult. All of a sudden, states were able to pass laws limiting public funds and coverage by private insurance for reproductive care, institute waiting periods and require multiple trips to clinics, enforce mandatory counseling before an abortion, or allow health care providers to refuse to perform abortions altogether. The people disproportionately harmed by these restrictions have been rural women, poor women, and black, brown, and indigenous women who already experience gaps in access to affordable health care and contraception. Medication abortion was introduced in September 2000, finally offering women a safe, private, and in theory, accessible alternative to undergoing a procedure at a clinic. But many states require that a woman who chooses medical abortion, which to be clear is a pill that she could just pick up at her local pharmacy and take in the privacy of her own home, to take that little pill in front of a doctor in a medical facility. Yes, I know. This history lesson is starting to get bleak, but here's a bit of good news. The passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010 meant an increase in contraception access as birth control became available without a copay. And the rise in contraceptive access coincided with a steep decline in abortions, which dropped from an all-time high of almost 1.5 million per year in 1990 to less than 900,000 by 2011. Let me repeat that. So this crazy thing happened when women had easy access to free contraception. Abortion rates plummeted. In fact, a study was done in Missouri that proved that if we really wanted to reduce or almost eliminate abortions, we'd make contraceptives free. In 2019, when ironically abortions were at a record low, an overwhelming wave of abortion bans began to sweep through red states in a race to provoke challenges that would rise to the Supreme Court and result in a decision that would overturn or totally gut Roe v. Wade once and for all. 25 abortion bans were enacted in 2019 alone, alongside many more restrictions. Hmm. Now, why would the anti-choice movement push all of these bans when abortion rates are at a record low? I mean, it's almost like maybe it's not about abortion. Yeah. And then in 2021, a year that introduced more restrictions on abortion than in any other time since 1973, the Supreme Court refused to block a Texas law that banned abortion at six weeks and created a vigilante justice system known as the Bounty Hunter Provision to enforce it. So instead of the state enforcing this law, ordinary people are deputized to sue those involved in performing abortions for a potential $10,000 cash reward. And this is after the Supreme Court of the United States had already agreed to hear arguments on a Mississippi law that would shorten the maximum time limit allowed for legal abortion by around two months, and if passed, could also mean the end of Roe. The scary thing is, Today, thanks to a decades-long coordinated campaign by conservative groups and the GOP, an anti-choice majority controls the Supreme Court.